What is your assessment of the attitude of the current Indonesian president towards this relationship? Okay, so again, I'm not going to pretend that I know exactly what's at the back of Jokowi's mind, but what's being said in the Indonesian media, if you read it carefully, you can see there are deep contestations within the government. Now, one of the things that strikes a real chord with a lot of Indonesians is, of course, that kind of economic nationalism as well as some kind of notion of sovereignty. And you will see that a lot of the defense of the death penalty has been in terms of this is our sovereignty that's being questioned by the outside. So I still can't give you an answer to whether or not there's been a deliberate slap in the face. But what we need to do is to understand Jokowi in the context of his own party political needs and his own kind of dependence on uh, popular support at a time, at a time when his popularity levels are very low. My perspective, however, has been looking at Indonesia from the perspective of Japan, from Korea, and from China, where I did much work. And in all those countries, they all see Indonesia as opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. 250 million people, as the foreign minister was saying earlier, in the next 25 years, it'll be about 275 million people, pushing 300 million people. Democratic economic reform has been going on for, for a decade. So there's this tremendous market and this tremendous role of Indonesia as a leader in the region. On top of that, when you take the broader narrative of in the zone, uh, you begin to recognize that as Australia is, you know, you know, at the centerpiece of the Indo-Pacific or the fulcrum point, it shares that role with Indonesia. So as much as the, the primary narrative in the region for the last 25 years has been the growth of China, I don't think anybody in this room would make the case that the primary narrative for the next 25 years is going to be the growth of China. China will continue to be important, but its growth is not the story. The growth for the next 25 years is the growth of India, the growth of Indonesia, the growing importance of ASEAN, and the, the expansion of that Indo-Pacific region. And so if you look at it in that context, again, whether it's economics, whether it's trade, whether it's resources, whether it's investment, whether it's population, Indonesia is all about opportunity. And yet the narrative here, particularly in the media, has been primarily, primarily driven by relationships. And by the midpoint of this century, 2050, Indonesia will be the fourth largest country in the world, more importantly, the fourth largest economy, US, China, uh, India, and Indonesia. Um, it'll certainly be in the G20. Australia, on a good day, will have a population of 35. So unless we, as a small country, a small, small populated country in an island continent, large landmass, scattered population centres, unless we bring to bear now all of the things which have made us a prosperous country, attractive place for direct foreign investment, a great trading nation, and start to transmit all of our ingenuity, expertise, services into not just China, but as Gordon has correctly said, it's not just the China, it's the, not, not just the rise of China, it's the rise of India, it's the emergence of Indonesia as a global phenomenon, not just a regional power, the rise of the ASEAN economies combined, and down the track, uh, Africa. So from a Western Australian Indian Ocean perspective, it's all about uh, ASEAN, India, uh, and ultimately Africa.